Hey everyone, this is Dr. Matthew Hernandez with the Ethos Athletes Podcast, and today we're going to be starting our series on low back pain. And for this particular series, I uh, brought back our uh, previous guest, Dr. Tom Padilla, who is the owner of the Doctors of Physical Therapy. Uh, Dr. Tom, welcome back to the show. Thanks. I'm excited to be here. This is my favorite topic. <clears throat> yeah, so Dr. Tom has, has really made a name for himself in addressing uh, low back pain, and so I really I wanted to bring him on so uh, our listeners can get an idea of... Um, what's causing low back pain, why some treatments don't work, and then you know a, a potential treatment approach that, that should be done uh, if you haven't gotten relief from other treatments uh, or you're looking for relief and, and you haven't sought out anybody prior to that. Um, so in this very first episode, we're going to discuss um, what causes low back pain and, um, and j- just kind of understand it a little bit more so you, you have a better understanding of what's going on with your body and why you're experiencing this. Uh, so before we start with that, uh, let's talk about uh, what, Dr. Talma, what got you into treating low back pain? Uh, well, it was kind of more by accident that I, that I kind of found my path at, at being really uh, good and effective at treating low back pain. And um, more, the more people that I treated successfully with low back pain, it started to just kind of spread itself. So I didn't set out like, hey, I'm going to be the low back pain and, and hip pain physical therapist because low back pain and hip pain often go hand in hand. Um, but as I, as I refined my treatments for low back pain, SI joint pain, um, hip pain at all. I found a way that um, all of it kind of links together, together, and um, and seems to work for a very large percentage of people. So the more people that I've been able to get better, the more and more um, complex these cases have gotten. And it's kind of cool because uh, at the at the root of it is uh, a similar dysfunction in everybody that that um, can really be targeted uh, to to reliably uh, treat most patients. Okay, and. Uh, as you've as you've treated this pain, like I mean, this is something that that we know is a growing problem in the U.S. Correct? Like this is probably the number one or number two um, yeah, it, most it makes, uh, cause of pain. Hundred billion dollars a year, over yeah, hundred billion. And you know, people are driven by like the fear of like not being able to hang out with their friends or go do the things that they want to be able to do anymore, and eventually just develops into this kind of like. Well, okay, nobody's been able to help it, and um, and so they'll go through these phases where people don't seek care for a while because they give up, but then they'll throw a bunch of money at it all at once because they get tired of it again. Yeah. Um, and so they kind of just go through these cycles over and over, and what you're seeing is that a few years ago it was $80 billion spent on low back pain in a year, and this last year it was over $100 billion. Yeah, it's crazy. It's nuts. Yeah, it's insane. So let, let's go into understanding this a little bit better, and I think um, one of the things that people hear the most or one of the – yeah, that the, the, the people hear the most when someone's complaining about low back pain is, you know, I, I threw my back out, right? So yeah. what what is what does that mean? And, you know, explain that to us a little bit more. Yeah, well, I usually ask people, like, where they throw it and if someone's going to throw, throw it back for them, right? Yeah. Because, <laughs> like, everybody said it, you know, um, I heard it growing up and, and nobody really knows what it means except everybody uh, relates to the experience. Like, because to some extent everybody's had small back tweaks and when you're younger you wonder is is this throwing my back out but then those tweaks get bigger and bigger and bigger to where somebody bends over to do something as small as pick up a kleenex or or a sheet of paper off the ground and that's when they quote unquote throw their back out you know they can they can go to the crossfit gym or they can go to just the the weight room and, and lift a bunch of weights and have no problem but then when they sneeze or they or they bend down to pick something up all of a sudden their back goes into spasm or seizure and uh not seizure not seizure but their back uh, goes into spasm and tenses up so what's actually happening when you're throwing your back out is it's it's more of a sequencing issue when you've had back injuries over a long period of time what happens initially during an injury because muscles aren't very smart the the big muscles that splint and protect and guard tighten up all the muscles know how to do is tighten up and relax. So when you have that injury, those larger muscles tighten up initially. And over time, while they're tight to try to guard and let the body heal, the pattern in the brain gets set. So now what's happening, instead of small muscles firing when you're doing little tasks, you have those big muscles that kind of stay tight and, and they're used to perform every task. 
So the small muscles are typically for when you're going to do something small, like reach for a water bottle or a pen or pick up that piece of paper off the ground. But what ends up happening is that as the big muscles start taking over, the small muscles become dormant and they stop being able to fire when you try to perform those small tasks. So when you actually throw your back out, maybe you've been to the gym and you've lifted a lot of weights that day and really fatigued the big muscles. And then you go and you reach down and you're trying to pick up that, that Kleenex or piece of paper, whatever it is, and the small muscles aren't firing and the big muscles are tired. All of a sudden, your body senses this destabilizing event where nothing's really holding anything in place. So it reacts by kind of freaking out and locking everything down quickly and essentially going into spasm where um, the muscles react very quickly. They tense up. You might have a little bit of muscular tearing in there. And then because the muscles reacted like that, you get a lot of jamming of the joints um, and, and the bones in the side of your spine. Okay. And yeah, I, I think that's what, what you said, I think really surprises a lot of people because I, I get patients who come in and they say, oh, well, yeah, I can lift a bunch of weight at the gym. But then, you know, they're like, oh, I go pick up like my dog's toy. And then like they, <laughs> yeah. they collapse on the ground because you know, they're in so much pain. Um, yeah. And so it, it's a sequencing issue in that case. That's that's the problem, correct? Absolutely. The small muscles aren't firing. And what kind of what kind of life is that? Right? I know. You go to the gym and you work out and then you get home and there's something on the floor and you're like, ah, maybe not today. Yeah. Yeah. So that, <laughs> that's definitely not fun. So so that's throwing your back out. Now, what, what are some other causes of low back pain? Um, so the way so the way that it's typically classified is by tissue source or like what what is causing your back pain. So if we're thinking about it from a um, the way that it's classically presented um, in medicine right now, you can have um, bone compression, which would be called like a facet issue um, that is responsible for radiating pain outside your low back and into the flank and into the hip. There can be muscle muscle tears. Um, there can be nerve compression at the spine. Um, that's, that's how low back pain would typically be classified. Um, what I see is true most of the time is most of these issues arise because of uh, movement impairments. So somebody's not recruiting the right muscles in the right order. Um, and over time, they're compensating a lot with other larger muscles and for like a long time you can get away with that mm. you can get away with performing movements with the wrong muscles just by using brute force um, and you won't know that you have these weaknesses in these smaller muscles so what it really comes down to is a uh, balance would be the easiest way um, to describe it between the small muscles that are supposed to stabilize and the larger muscles that are supposed to move without the muscles stabilizing close to the joints the movers that are outside of those muscles also become the stabilizers. So they're both responsible now for moving and for stabilizing. And it leads to a lot of uh, um, incorrect movement patterns, which over time, performing those movement patterns over and over and over again will then lead to the damage in that joint, in that muscle, in that nerve, and lead to the symptoms that you're now feeling. But most of it comes all the way back to is the sequencing of the the muscle activation correct? Okay. And that's what allows you to move correctly, and that's what allows you to stay injury free. Okay. Now, how how big of a, or I guess let's start with the the easiest one. So, we know that uh, a lot of people when they go and they have back pain, one of the first things they go is, oh, I need to go to the chiropractor because you know the spine is out of line whatever it is now how much of a factor is that typically when when you're looking at low back pain so alignment is huge mm -hmm. absolutely um, one of the first things you want to be able to achieve when you're trying to, to rehabilitate from back pain is good alignment because what leads to this ongoing back pain like I said is the stability and the <coughs> and the movement pattern issue if you're not in good alignment and you're trying to activate the muscles in the right sequence, well, your skeleton isn't where it needs to be to allow those muscles to activate correctly. Um, so alignment is huge, uh, but a lot of the times what, um, so there are some adjustments that chiropractic care does do that addresses alignment, um, but most of the time what 
what chiropractors are addressing when they're manipulating joints uh, through the lumbar and thoracic spine, so through the low back and the mid back, is they're addressing joints that aren't moving well together. They're not pushing things back into alignment. They're simply increasing the mobility between each segment of the spine. And that is important in someone who, uh, who has had a lot of this restriction for a long period of time, but it's, it's short-lived, right? So that's why you need to come in behind that with the, the corrective sequencing exercises to get the body to actually use the motion correctly that you're giving it. Otherwise, you get these people that are stuck in these loops where they will, uh, they'll they'll go get adjusted, the movement improves, they feel good for a while because it takes pressure off of what was causing them pain, but slowly but surely the muscles, um, without, without teaching them to sequence correctly, they just allow the skeleton to kind of go exactly back where it was. Okay. And so then you get stuck in this needing needing adjustments and, and realignments, you know. Okay. And... Um... The next thing that people always talk about or mention or they're worried about at least is they have a bulging disc or they have a disc herniation. How how much how much have you seen that uh, actually cause pain compared to it's just a you know yes we found that on the MRI but it's actually not the cause of your pain. So I've I've worked with a few people who have had true herniations and that that is a longer healing process because you're waiting for the the disc material to get back inside the spine um, depending on the si- uh, size of the uh, size of the herniation but the the misconception about bulging discs is where it really kind of gets crazy because a lot of people have bulging discs I mean I think the statistics are 42 percent of people above the age of 30 okay. have mild bulging in their discs and there's plenty of research to support that there are healthy individuals that have severely bulging discs that never have pain. Mm-hmm. And once you tell them that they have bulging discs, they start to get pain. Right. Right. There's tons, there's tons of research to support that and to back that up. Um, and what they're finding, and people may have noticed this, uh, doctors are more and more reluctant to actually prescribe or uh, give people referrals to get MRIs mm-hmm. unless they've tried something else first. Because what they're finding is that those images aren't always uh, don't always correlate to somebody's true symptoms. Right. And very infrequently do I do I find that um, a bulging disc is what's responsible for the entirety of a person's pain. If you're thinking about it from a, the, the standpoint of the disc is mostly water mm-hmm. for most of our lives, right? And if the muscles in the back are tense or tight or trying to support too much, well, theoretically, that's causing compression in between the spine, the joints in the spine, right? Well, that compression, if you think about compressing water or, or sponge, right? Yeah. The disc will look like it is isn't. It is actually bulging or it'll cause the water to not be able to refill okay. um, into the disc. So in terms of bulging discs, they can be the source of a little bit of pain, but I don't ever think that they're really the cause okay. of the pain. The movement's the cause, the balance between those muscles is the cause, um, and you have to reestablish that before anything else. Okay. Now, earlier you also mentioned that um, hip pain or hip, hip and low back pain kind of go hand in hand. So what, why is that? Um, so if you if you look at the, the human skeletal system, we have you know both legs, which lead up into our hips, and then the spine sits right in the middle on top of that. Now, that means that if your hips aren't able to absorb the load that is happening when you're walking over the ground, that load is going to be transmitted somewhere, right? Now, that can be down to the ankle or to the knee, but uh, much of the time, it's up to the spine. So the spine, once it leaves the, the hips at the lower level, goes through a period where it's only contacted by muscles all the way up until it reaches the ribs. So there's nothing, there's no like scaffolding, right? Right, It'd be like the third floor of the building is just the elevator shaft, Okay. right? And so you need those hips to be able to absorb that shock so that it doesn't get transmitted up to the, up to that, uh, to that spinal level, right? So if you think of Jenga, right? Right, right. And you're pulling those blocks out. Once you remove the lower pieces, 
everything becomes a lot more wobbly, okay. right? And and it can can fall at that higher point. So when you decrease when you have decreased stability at the hips, that force gets transmitted to the spine, and again can cause muscles to overreact by tightening to uh, compensate for the lack of stability either at the hips or at the spine. Okay. So we we've discussed a few different things. Uh, we we talked about how sequencing can affect low back pain, uh, alignment, spasms, uh, herniation or disbulging, and then hip problems. So we discussed all those things, and and those are just kind of like the common ones. I I don't know how many people correlate the hip with low back pain, but it's a good one to know because it's I think it's often missed, right? Absolutely, it's it's missed, and most people. So the hip is like a very ambiguous term, right? Right. right. If you say you have hip pain to somebody that could mean SI joint, right? Right. That could mean, um, in the front of the hip, right. That could mean in the glute area that mm-hmm. could be just below the hip. That could be sciatica, right. Uh, that goes all the way down the leg. It could be side of the hip pain that, um, occurs when they sleep on their side at night. So the cause of that would be like bursitis, yeah. right. Due to a tight TFL because the low back and the, and the hips aren't working together appropriately. Um, so, Hip is a super ambiguous term when it comes to describing um, like a problem that someone is having. So you could talk to 20 different people and they could have a different definition of hip pain. Of what hip pain is. Yeah, Yeah, for sure. Um, So we we discussed those. Are there any others that we missed that are the thoughts or common reasons why people think they're experiencing low back pain? Uh, So... Why people think that they're experiencing low back pain, I, I think that we nailed it. Okay, cool, you know, perfect. Those are, those are the main issues that people think they have. SI joint pain. SI right? joint pain, yeah. Um, they think that their their pelvis is torqued one way or the other. They okay. have an anterior, posterior rotation mm-hmm. or an upslip, which a lot of people do. Right. Um, so I think between those ones, um, muscle tightness, right, okay. is people, people think that, um, that the muscles are tightening and that's – or just getting short – and that's the cause, right? Right. So, like, oh, I notice one hamstring is tighter than the other, or I notice my piriformis um, just always gets tight, and my hip flexors, my psas, I just have to mash on this until, well, I guess forever, right? Because yeah, <laughs> it yeah, doesn't, it doesn't last forever, and every time you go to work out, you have to do it again, right? Right. Um, so people uh, are, I think they're aware that it's not the solution, mm-hmm. but it's the most effective for daily short-term relief okay. that they can, they manage to do at the time. So um, I do think that people are, are starting, uh, they do think that muscle tightness is the cause, but they're almost there. It's that imbalance, that tightness is caused by, you have to go one more step, a weakness. Right. right? And, and I remember you mentioned, yeah, in your mobility or in our mobility discussion, um, in some of our earlier episodes that if you're having to constantly roll out or do um, like a lacrosse bar or a foam roller or something, that it's it's probably because you have a weakness somewhere that's causing that muscle tightness, correct? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, they compensate. That's, yeah. What, they're, that's what they're there for is to splint, to support, and they will do so to a fault. Okay. Um, and the research shows that once that pattern has been ingrained in the brain, it doesn't reverse it, reverse itself. In other words, the brain will still fire out of order until you actually go through steps to uh, reactivate the correct muscles. So first you align, then you reactivate the correct muscles, and uh, and then you start addressing all those tightnesses. Right? Okay. Okay. Um, what about? Um... Like you, we mentioned nerve compression earlier, but we didn't really discuss it directly. At least, what where does nerve compression fall within these, you know, within the ones that we've t- we've talked about so far? I mean, it's just like just like everything else here. It's all a symptom, right? Right. This is the symptom that you feel with this particular impairment. There are forty five muscles that attach to the pelvis, right? So if you have a misalignment and the muscles all tighten up to overreact, I've had I've had people with different presentations it could be the back tightens up to compensate for that misalignment and i've had it as far as like the pelvic floor so muscles around the the anus have tightened up and people get like a lot of uh coccyx pain okay because of that okay and it's been kind of cool and crazy to see that yeah. like when you correct the alignment and then you reestablish the right order that things are supposed to fire in, those muscles actually start to relax. Okay. And those were just the muscles in particular that tightened up. So if the muscles that tighten up 
are the ones that cross your lumbar spine and they then pinch down on the joints, you're gonna get that joint pain. If they pinch down on the joints long enough, you're gonna get start to get that nerve root pain. If the piriformis is a muscle that decides to tighten up, well, most people's piriformis muscle runs right over their sciatic nerve. So they're going to start getting uh, the nerve pain down the leg or into the foot. Um, and then, you know, if the TFL or IT band tightens up, you could get um, you could get that bursitis in the side of your hip. If the hip flexor on the other side tightens up, the coolest one that I ever saw was this one patient had her foot kept going cold, and uh, it, it was just the right foot. We you know screen for any sort of vascular issues or, or anything that would uh, that would cause that that would be an emergent situation. Yeah. Right. But what had actually happened was there's, there's only so much space in between the front of your pelvic bone and a ligament that runs across the front of your pelvis. The hip flexor is in that space. And so is the, the artery. Yeah. And her hip flexor was so overused and so tight. This is what we think hypothetically because, because her issue resolved with this type of treatment. Okay. Um, we think her hip flexor was so tight that it was reducing the space that that artery had to run and was actually causing Makes her sense. to get a cold foot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So just compressing that artery. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. It was sure. nuts. That's crazy. So like whether it's whether it's nerve or whether it's you know your foot's going cold or a lot of a lot of this stuff is just a symptom <clears throat> of an underlying movement and uh, muscle sequencing pattern uh, issue. Awesome. That's cool. Um, yeah. So so just to recap again on on the different things we discussed as as far as common reasons why people think they're experiencing low back pain. Uh, so there's a sequencing issue. There's alignment when when people believe that their spine are mis- is misaligned. There's muscle tightness, muscle spasms, uh, herniations or bulging disc, hip problems, um, nerve compression, uh, which kind of goes in with bulging disc herniation a little bit. Um, so the, those are just a, a few of the reasons people are told they're experiencing problems. Uh, in the next few episodes, we're going to go into um, diving into those a little bit more and, and discussing why treat like, why uh, treatments don't always work for these things. Uh, and then in our last episode of the series, we're going to go ahead and give you um, an approach that that we believe you should be taking uh, when it comes to addressing your low back pain. Uh, so, Dr. Tom, thanks again for being on the show. Thanks for having me. Uh, and and uh, look forward to. Uh, having everyone or having everyone listen to the next episode and we'll catch you then.